some level of higher levels of pediatric care and, and working in coordination with children's uh, and their pediatric pulmonologists to provide this care. So I think we're anticipating, as seen in the southern states, that we're going to see increased numbers of pediatric patients uh, hospitalized. Does a statement by the governor like that undermine um, the your efforts to try and get people vaccinated and to be on the on the lookout for uh, cases of COVID within their own families? The pandemic is not over, and so we need to be uh, very cognizant that it's around us. It it is killing our neighbors. And so we do need to be aware of, of that fact. And, and so we really recommend masks, distancing, good hand hygiene. Um, and so that's good for our community. In, in addition, we're gonna have additional beds with the Hubbard Center for Children opening the end of this month. And that's also very good for our community. I wanted to go back to some of the exemptions that um, would qualify someone to not get um, a COVID-19 vaccine. I saw in, you know, you guys have talked about it, but I also saw in the press release that was sent out like religious exemptions. I mean, what, where do we draw the line? You know, is someone going to be able to say, you know, because I am a Christian, I believe that I should not have to take the vaccine. I mean, where are we drawing these lines on what we approve to be a, um, valid exemption for a reason to not get the vaccine. I'd be happy to respond to that question. I, I would say this, that we will address each case on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, clearly, you know, general philosophical beliefs, um, uh, socio-political uh, beliefs uh, will not qualify. Uh, but we will take each case on a case-by-case -case basis and address the merits of each individual request. Yeah, what are the- As you've heard from, from Dr. Ward, uh, we continue to noodle through these, uh, these kind of topics and uh, similar to Nebraska Medicine, we will be taking every one of these exemptions on a, a case by case basis. Uh, we respect, we're, we're one team at Children's and we respect everyone's beliefs and values uh, and so we will have that conversation. What happens if an employee still declines or refuses to get the vaccine? What will you guys do at that point? So one of the questions about not getting the vaccine when it's recommended by so many organizations is, are, is that person the right fit for our culture? And, and maybe not, and they're allowed to make a choice. They can make that choice that, that uh, they really don't wanna work at Children's Hospital and Medical Center. And that's unfortunate, right? We want everybody to enjoy coming to work. Uh, and, and yet people make choices all the time. Yeah, and I, I wanna agree with uh, what Chris said. I mean, I, I think that we, we all uh, are in agreement that, that this is truly uh, a requirement uh, to get this, that we, we want to allow, we want to respect a religious strong, even some strongly held beliefs, uh, and certainly diseases or reactions to vaccine or vaccine components uh, that that warrant a, a reasonable exemption. Uh, but for those who clearly uh, do not uh, refuse to get the vaccine, uh, for CHI Health, this is a condition of employment. Uh, it it is required of, of everyone who works here. Uh, we also have heard some good stories about hospitals that have required this have actually attracted a lot of employees uh, because they want to be around people who have the same approach. They want to be around people who are vaccinated. Uh, they want to feel safer uh, when they're at work, less likelihood of the, if someone has an asymptomatic uh, uh, disease and they're carrying it, they want to be less likely to, to get the disease. Uh, so uh, we, we think that's a positive also. When it comes down to it, we're, we're ultimately um, responsible for the safety of our patients. And that, that's what it comes down to. Having a vaccinated staff care for those patients is without a doubt uh, the safest way to accomplish that. It's almost getting to the point now where our patients are expecting uh, to be cared for by a vaccinated staff. And, and I don't blame them. That, that's who I would, would want caring for me. I would echo the comments uh, that have been made here before. It's, it is a condition for employment at Nebraska Medicine. Uh, we've also extended that 
requirement to our entire medical staff, whether they're employed or part of the community uh, uh, provider group. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Schmidt said, this is, this is a way we can protect our patients. Uh, equally as important, this is how we protect our staff. And I think you've heard the concerns raised by others uh, that we have about uh, uh, the workforce in general and the workforce shortages specifically that not only affect us here in the Omaha and Lincoln uh, metro communities, but across the country. And so we feel obligated uh, to deliver on the brand promise of, of, of safety uh, and protecting uh, those that are able to deliver the type of care and, and answer to the expectation, as Dr. Smith said, that our patients and families have when they come to our facilities. I would wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Frankel. A question that Josh posed in the chat for everyone, do you anticipate with the rise in cases we're seeing now, would we ever go back to where we were in the spring of 2020 where non-emergent or elective procedures and surgeries were postponed? Well, I would, I would say this, that, you know, as part of any uh, contingency planning for surges, whatever it may be due to, we will exercise um, whatever operational levers we have to pull uh, to accommodate um, uh, uh, and be able to care for the patients that need us. We have a pandemic team that's meeting on a regular basis to review these, review uh, uh, caseloads, inpatient status, number of COVID patients, and what processes and, and things we need to do to care for those patients uh, in the community and, and in greater Nebraska. So we'll make those decisions uh, as appropriate to open up beds uh, as we see the, the need meets. Unlike in the adult centers, there's rarely an elective procedure that a child needs to have. It may be able to be deferred a little bit, uh, however, it, it, most of those are rare. Even during the, the height of the pandemic, uh, we, were, we ran a, a pretty busy OR. Now, some of the families decided they wanted to hold off. That was up to them rather than come to the hospital. Uh, and and the part of our surge plan all every day is to look at the cases that are coming in, whether they're medical or surgical, uh, to make sure that we can handle them safely. One other comment I want to make. Oh, I'll no, I was make one other comment say, about. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say all of us, I believe, have surge plans. Um, we would all like to not have to use them, um, but it, it just depends on what happens with the numbers. Yeah, I was just going to emphasize about when we talk about elective surgeries. Many of what are truly elective surgeries are outpatient procedures that don't require an inpatient bed. That's the most common type of elective surgery. These other surgeries that we're talking about that we consider elective, surgeries that can be delayed for three days or a week or two weeks, oftentimes are cancer resections, um, needed surgeries that, that, that patients have delayed. Some of these are cardiac catheterizations, bypass surgery. Uh, th these are really needed surgeries um, for patients that have already delayed sometimes by weeks or months, even from last year in some cases uh, that, that at times need to be done. So I think we have to be thoughtful about what types of cases we delay. Circling back around to children, you mentioned uh, previously that cases in children aren't as bad as what we're seeing elsewhere. Um, but something that uh, my colleague asked in the chat and I wanted to touch base on as well. Obviously, those child numbers aren't as bad as they are elsewhere, but is there any particular reason why we're not seeing those child numbers? Uh, the pediatric cases haven't been released, to my knowledge, from any of the various hospitals or health departments. Is there any reason for that? I guess I need a clarification of the question. Are you asking about here in Omaha or around the country? I'm asking locally. We have not been able to find any numbers from any of our local, any of our local facilities about child numbers. They haven't been released or anything to my knowledge. Well, uh, it's not a secret. Uh, so uh, I don't know where you found them last year at this time or even two years ago. Uh, we haven't changed our processes now. When there was the public health emergency, uh, we were we were every day we were sending our data, and maybe that's where you were seeing it on some of the 
the state funded websites. Uh, we continue to send data to the Knowledge Center. However, those websites are no longer uh, being displayed since the public health emergency has been lifted. I think that's a disadvantage uh, for the public to not have access to the uh, data dashboards with the state and having the state put additional restrictions on, on what numbers are released to uh, Nebraska? I believe it's a disadvantage. I would like to see the dashboard back up and active. Yeah, and I would add, you know, data is powerful. Data can be educational. It certainly helps us uh, gain line of sight to what's happening across the state. Uh, it helps us plan uh, uh, for what might be expected uh, or be asked of us in Nebraska medicine. Um, I will say this, that we have um, lobbied the governor's office through the chief medical officer uh, to reinstate uh, the statewide dashboard reporting. Uh, I'm also aware that there are a handful of senators that have sponsored a bill uh, to bring back uh, the dashboard reporting as well. So I, I think that it's uh, 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 fairly uh, unanimous in our feelings that you know data is powerful. Data helps us plan. Uh, and to have that data that we had under the PHE would be welcome once again. And unless anyone here knows differently, we have heard from the, the governor and the state's chief medical officer that they are trying to get that up and going, you know, in part due to some of the efforts of, from people on this call. Julie's asking a follow-up question here about um, whether our health systems attorneys agree with the state's reasoning for not providing data. Maybe hard to answer without our, our legal folks here, but yeah, I don't know. May have to take that as a follow up question, then perhaps. Any other questions from our reporter panel? Um, I've been trying to get through the ones that come in through the chat, but if I've missed any by chance, please feel free to open your mic and ask here or um, put them in the chat. I feel like we're getting close to having all of the questions.